Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to induct Harry Weber in the St. Louis Walk. Del Mar Loop businessman Joe Edwards introduced the newest St. Louis Walk of Fame honoree, St. Louis sculptor Harry Weber. Among those he thanked at the ceremony were the 26 other notable St. Louisans on the Walk of Fame that he has made statues of. Uh, it's a little ironic that I am being honored for honoring people, but I'll take it. Thank you very much. You know, I often say that I live in the reflected glory of my subject matter. But Harry Weber himself has quite a story, which we were able to tell a few years ago as he was completing another statue of a famous St. Louisan. Drawing is my entertainment. Uh, sculpture is my business. You probably know sculptor Harry Weber's work, even if you maybe don't know his name. He's the one who did all of the Hall of Famer statues outside Bush Stadium. In fact, his sports sculptures can be found all over the country. But he also did the Dred and Harriet Scott statue at the old courthouse. The bull and bear fighting it out outside Stiefel Financial downtown. Chuck Berry in the loop, he did that. And now he's completed a seven-foot-tall nice. statue of David R. Francis, 19th century mayor of St. Louis, governor of Missouri, cabinet member, head of the 1904 World's Fair, ambassador to Russia. His name is still out there, Francis Field at Wash U, Francis Quadrangle at Mizzou, and Francis Park in South St. Louis. And that's where the statue will be going because, well, because some folks from that neighborhood wanted David Francis to be more than a name. And so they turned to Harry Weber. And the real trick is that when somebody asks you to do a statue of, here's a picture of so-and-so, the picture is fine, but you got to make the thing work 360 degrees and up and down. And so a lot of it is imagination. So we do a lot of preliminary sketches to make sure that the pose we have works all the way around. Yeah, kind of you want somebody coming back from that time who knew him to say, oh, yeah. You got it. Yeah, and you have to imagine, I think, in your head, because I think I'm not a big fan of sort of monumental statues. Uh, I like personality to come through. So you have to imagine in your own head, what was this guy like? You know, was he in fact uh, the archetypical mover and shaker of the time, which in fact he probably was. I look at the stuff, some of the stuff that, that people are most familiar with that you've done in St. Louis are the sports figures, and, and that's probably true right. around the rest of the country as well. What amazes me about your work is your ability to capture motion and movement right. in such a realistic way. And uh, one thing Rodin never had was stainless steel supports. So even his walking man had to have two points of contact, uh, you know, because bronze was not sturdy enough to hold itself up. But a stainless steel skeleton allows us to make them fly. Look at what he was able to do for the Boston Bruins, depicting the famous moment after Bobby Orr scored the goal that beat the Blues in the 1970 Stanley Cup. Hi, Bobby Orr is, I know, about a thousand pounds of bronze suspended on his right toe, uh, which is kind of fun. And Red Shandings is, is yeah. again, he's, he's in midair. Right, so there's, there's a little a, cloud of dust there yeah, that's holding right. him up. Yeah, I, I, I love little clouds of dust. <laughs> but. So there's a technological thing about making a move, but then there's also a process, which I think a lot of people overwork clay to the point that it, in my mind, it just shuts down. It stops being real. It turns into something that's too exact, too perfect. And I like to think that the sculptures that I do have the same spontaneity as a sketch that took me six minutes, the sculpture took me six months. That, but they've got to be alive. And I love movement. I love, I love what the human body can do. I'm not that much of a sports fan as much as I'm a fan of guys that do sports because they're moving most of the time. When it comes to movement, the David Francis statue is a little more subtle. There's the posture, a coattail that flaps in the wind. And Harry Weber spent a lot of time on the face because he's not just capturing a moment, but an emotion. So much of what makes this work is the expression on their face. Oh, no kidding. I mean, I, I like saying this is the reason that we don't go around sniffing each other's butts like dogs do, is this is such an exquisite communicator of what's on our mind, what we're doing at the time. So that's what you want to get on the statue. And somebody uh, 
when we did Bob Gibson said, you know, I'm not sure Bob's going to like it so much uh, that you've got him grimacing like that. And uh, we asked Bob about it and he said, you don't look real happy when you're delivering a 100 mile an hour fastball towards somebody you don't like. Another prominent Weber sculpture is the one on the St. Louis Riverfront depicting Lewis and Clark's return from their expedition. It's a moment of triumph, but Weber saw more than that. You know, Meriwether Lewis, I wanted to get him on the fact that he, even in the time that he was, uh, of his biggest triumph was part of his biggest sadness. Yeah. You know, the best part of his life was over. Weber creates his statues out of clay in one studio. They are cast in bronze in pieces out of town and assembled in a workspace in Soulard. Weber's quick to point out that this is not a one-man show. Artisans Vlad Jitomirsky and Misha Matveyev are essential to creating the finished product. Right, and there's a lot of collaboration and there's a lot of mutual trust. Uh, when we did the thing on the riverfront, the Lewis and Clark, which is was 22 feet high by the time we installed it, and it was cast in 198 pieces. And if you can imagine Vlad and Misha putting together a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle where each piece weighs 50 to 100 pounds, uh, that's, I don't think I could lift 50 or 100 pounds. So that's up to them, not to me. So it's the process that you remember just as much as the end result. And, uh, it's so the that, collaborative. I think people don't necessarily oh, yeah. understand yeah. The collaboration. They're thinking you're there with some clay and all by yourself and the finished product is done when you're done. Right. And there's a lot of collaboration and there's a lot of mutual trust. You're, you're doing something that a lot of us feel like we're not, which is leaving something behind. You talk about immortalizing them. In a way, you're immortalizing yourself. I mean, these things will be around for a long time. Yeah, the things will be around for a long time, but like Francis Park is around for a long time and Francis Fields around for a long time, but they don't really remember who Francis was. I think people will see the statues. I'm not really sure if they'll remember Harry Weber. Uh, maybe my daughter will. But <laughs> I think sculptors are uh, fairly anonymous most of the time. And we know of each other and I think that's pretty much it. The people I've taught with, rode with, served with, worked with, talked with, made my life worth living. And they're the stars here. And a little English major of me, and if you've heard this before, don't stop me. Uh, from Keats, think where man's glory begins and ends, and say my glory was I had such friends. Thank you. For Living St. Louis, I'm Jim Kircher.